Chris is a, uh, you know, one of one of the bright shining lights in um, veterinary surgery right now. He just finished up a surgical oncology fellowship uh, at CSU, and he has been a great addition to the VES executive committee. He is our uh, website uh, and basically technological uh, master. And uh, he's been, like I said, driving force and getting going these webinars, not just uh, you know for the members and training group, but just all of our webinars and, and other events in general. So Chris has been awesome for uh, the VES and he is just about to start a uh, position in San Diego at the um, Veterinary Specialty Hospital in uh, North County. And so, uh, you know, we're, uh, again, super happy to have uh, Chris on board with the VES and uh, looking forward to all the other uh, great additions that he brings. Thanks. Um, so get started. So um, going to run through cryptorchidectomy. Um, honestly, it's a, a great procedure for beginning surgeons just because it is a, uh, a relatively straightforward procedure, meaning that um, it's something that is really good if you're just getting started with some of your laparoscopic skills. Um, it gives a great opportunity to um, practice your access, practice, um, again, working with the vessel sealer, and then um, just general triangulation and laparoscopic um, techniques. Um, similar to Dr. Sin, you really got to emphasize, we got a lot of um, really exciting things coming up for VES. Um, one that I'm in particular really excited about is going to be this webinar um, in October. So Wednesday, October 21st. Um, you'll find, a, or at least me personally with surgery, one of the greatest learning opportunities I've, I've definitely found are hearing from and experiencing um, other surgeons' complications and particularly how they manage those. Um, so super excited about this, this lecture. Um, it may actually include a, a human minimally invasive surgeon as well. Um, someone that does minimally invasive surgery for humans. So um, going to be a very exciting opportunity for everyone. Um, and again, if you're interested in joining VES, please let me know, uh, just because we do have a lot of very exciting things coming up. Um, so getting into cryptorchidectomies. So um, cryptor as Obviously, many of us know cryptorchidism is a very well-known congenital disease that occurs in numerous species. Um, by definition, it's just a failure of descent or of one or more testes. Uh, the problem generally presents in juvenile patients and of certain breeds in particular. Um, so specifically, mini poodles, chihuahuas, boxers, German shepherds, Yorkies, mini schnauzers, a lot of smaller dogs typically we'll see this in. Um, it is a hereditary disorder. Uh, the, the genetics of it are a little complex and still unknown at this time, but we do suspect that it's polygenic, meaning multiple genes are influencing the um, hereditary nature of this. Um, it also happens in cats. There's a couple reports of um, both open as well as laparoscopic and laparoscopic, laparoscopic assisted cryptorchidectomies in cats. So um, it definitely is something that um, you have to keep in the back of your mind for cats. Um, similar to dogs, we do think that it's likely hereditary and has um, some predisposition. So Persians are likely to be predisposed based off of the frequency that we encounter it with them. Um, regardless of the debate on neuter and normal animals, there definitely is a very strong argument to be made in favor of surgical removal of cryptorchid testes. So in addition to removing these dogs from the gene pool, cryptorchid testicles do have an increased relative risk for neoplastic development. Uh, so specifically, um, Sertoli cell tumors and seminomas are very common for cryptorchid testes. Um, depending on the paper and depending on the age of the patient, um, these cryptorchid testicles can have up to a 13 times odd ratio for developing testicular neoplasia. Um, and again, very dependent on the age at which the, the testes are removed, but they can have anywhere from a 7 to 55% incidence of neoplasia within cryptorchid testes. So obviously the younger patients, there's around that 7%, the older to middle age, um, it's around that 55%. Um, in addition to the testicular neoplasia, these patients are at risk for testicular torsion. 
Um, so again, a, a reason to surgically remove them. And then lastly, it's associated with cryptorchidism, but obviously um, likely just correlated, not uh, associated with causation. But um, patients with cryptorchidism often do have other underlying or hereditary congenital diseases. So specifically, hernia, hip dysplasia, and patellar luxation have all been found at a higher incidence for patients with cryptorchidism. So very important to do a full physical exam, make sure that we're evaluating the entire patient, not just um, the presenting clinical signs. Um, in terms of diagnosis, uh, diagnosis in, of not only cryptorchidism, but also localization can be a challenge. Um, physical exam alone is often not sensitive enough to detect the testes unless they're located directly within the inguinal region. Um, however, other findings within your physical exam can be useful to determine or help to identify whether or not the patient is intact. So, for instance, um, a good rectal exam to evaluate the prostate will be important to help um, kind of identify or further support whether or not a patient is still intact and therefore has a cryptorchid testicle. Um, if you still have concerns um, based off of your palpation and um, want to do a hormonal say, you can do a gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulation test um, because detectable value elevations of testosterone concentration will be found with a GNRH stim um, to ensure that the patient has not been previously castrated. In terms of diagnostic imaging, um, typically the standard these days seems to be abdominal ultrasound, at least from the institutions that I've been at. Um, often this is performed under sedation um, and you do see a very classic uh, appearance on the ultrasound. So um, this here is your uh, testicle. Um, this is within the abdomen. It's right next to your caudal vena cava. You can see loops of intestine on either side. Um, and again, this hyperechoic line that's tracing right down the middle of the testicle is um, very classic or pathognomonic for a testicle. Um, similarly, down here, you can see here is your testicle. This is next to the colon. So um, the, the testes can be located anywhere from the kidney down to the inguinal canal. Um, and ultrasound has a roughly 96% sensitivity for identifying these cryptorchid testes. Uh, so it is a very useful diagnostic test. In some of our older patients, if there is a mass effect related to the testes and you actually lose this hyperechoic line, there may be a benefit or there may be a, um, a need to jump to CT scans as well. Um, and specifically, if you're concerned about neoplasia, as we saw in this previous image, um, they can have mass effects that develops within the abdomen that may be underappreciated on the abdominal ultrasound. So uh, I do think for older patients, CT may be of benefit. Um, and then laparoscopy can be considered as a form of diagnostic imaging. Um, in people, they actually utilize laparoscopy to um, confirm the location and to confirm whether or not uh, a patient is cryptorchid. So um, it definitely has its place in addition to the, the other um, imaging, even if these patients um, are going to need an open procedure, laparoscopy can still be uh, beneficial. So in terms of treatment options, uh, today there have been multiple descriptions of surgical techniques for cryptorchidectomies. Generally, it's a variation on an open approach, a laparoscopic assisted approach, or a total laparoscopic surgery. Again, laparoscopy has been utilized for human patients with suspected cryptorchidism all the way since 1976, and is now commonly utilized for both diagnosis and treatment. Uh, similarly, in vet med, laparoscopy has been um, utilized for assisting in the diagnosis of laterality, as well as the location since 1993. So it's definitely something that, again, if you want to start um, performing laparoscopy, it's a very good procedure and disease process to, to use to build your skills. Um, there was a, a more recent paper that looked at a larger group of dogs uh, that underwent a single port laparoscopic cryptorchidectomy. It's by Runge et al. Um, in 2014. They had a total of 25 cases. The, the paper itself did describe that the procedure, again, is very straightforward. Some of the procedures or some of these surgeries were as short as 15 minutes long. Uh, so this is something that can be done in a very short period of time and uh, generally can be very straightforward if these are um, simple cryptorchid patients. 
Um, one thing I will advise actually against is considering a mini laparotomy cryptorchidectomy. Uh, a lot of people will make the statement or make the claim that um, if you have a good idea where the uh, cryptorchid testicle is, you can just do a mini laparotomy right over the region of the suspected cryptorchid testicle. Um, again, the big reason I would actually advise against this is that it's been reported numerous times in the veteran literature in particular that um, these mini laparotomies are associated with inadvertent prostatectomies, inadvertent avulsions of the urethra, as well as damage to the ureter. So um, it, it is something that can be done. Um, it is something that has been shown to have a, a significant risk of major or devastating complications. Um, whereas you can still get the same exact uh, incision size through laparoscopy or laparoscopic assisted. So um, I would definitely emphasize the benefit or the use of laparoscopy to um, be able to perform that mini, uh, minimally morbid procedure, but with the benefit of visualization and magnification. So our setup for this is actually going to be quite similar to the ovariectomy. The biggest difference that I would um, emphasize or recommend is you're working in the caudal half of the patient for the entire procedure, unless you're doing something in addition to your cryptorchidectomy, whether it's a gastropexy or some uh, biopsy. But if you're just going to be doing the cryptorchidectomy, um, since you're only working in the caudal half, making sure your monitor is actually in the, the caudal portion of the patient is very important. Um, we've all been there where you're getting set up and you're already draped, the patient is sterile and scrubbed, and you realize that your monitor is off on the other side of the room. And so you're going to be spending the entire procedure with your neck crank. So um, again, just make sure that you have things set up to ease your workflow for these patients and for the situation. Um, in terms of equipment needed, uh, very similar to the ovariectomy, most of us are going to be using a five millimeter zero or 30 degree scope. Um, again, I definitely have a preference or a bias towards the 30 degree scope just because it gives you that added benefit of triangulation and getting your hands to clash less if you're going to be using a, a sills port or a single port. Um, again, similar to the ovariectomy, it's going to be done with multi port or through the sills port alone. Um, so it really depends on your, your comfort level, your preferences. Um, it can be done either way. If there is concern about neoplasia or if there is concern about a mass effect within the testicle, I would recommend considering a wound retractor or to consider um, using some kind of um, bag retrieval system. Um, just because, again, the last thing that we want is to be tracking any of that potential neoplastic tissue through the open surgical site and risking contamination and seeding. Outside of that, really minimal equipment needs. You need a blunt probe that we, again, will use for almost any laparoscopic procedure, grasping forceps, and then most of us are using a vessel sealing device. Um, if you don't have the ability to use a vessel sealing device, you can do all of this through a laparoscopic assisted approach, and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, for our patients, we generally put them in dorsal recumbency, and then it can be a benefit to either have them in a Trendelenburg position or at least have the opportunity or ability to put them in a Trendelenburg position. Um, what I mean by this is putting their head down. So again, using gravity as your friend, you can um, put the call half more at an elevated position so that the intestines are actually naturally going to flow away from where you're working. Um, again, can be a, a huge help and can um, minimize the uh, smaller working space of the caudal half caudal position of the body. Uh, insulation, again, very classic for most of our simple procedures, eight to 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, and then one big thing I would say that can be of a big help if you're gonna be doing these procedures is to actually empty the urinary bladder prior to surgery. Um, a lot of times you'll see that the testicles are around in the area of the inguinal canal um, or right next to the colon in urinary bladder. And if they do have a very large urinary bladder, you are going to have a hard time getting around that, especially if you're um, dealing with a bilaterally cryptorchid patient. So um, it can be a big help to your, empty your urinary bladder. Um, again, just port positioning for these patients. Um, generally, I think a lot of us are going to naturally favor a SILS port or a single incision um, device to be able to do these procedures just because you're pulling something out. And so you're going to have to make your incision 
uh, roughly two to three centimeters anyway. So if you're already doing that, um, definitely there is a potential benefit of popping in the sills port. It does have the added challenge of needing to triangulate and your, your hands can clash more just because you're in a, uh, more narrow position. But, um, Again, if you have the abilities, if you want to work on those skills, this can be a good case to work on your triangulation and do a reduced port procedure. Um, definitely could consider multi-port as well. There are a lot of people that um, are incredibly efficient and uh, will um, only do a multi-port for these, these procedures. Um, so again, could consider a multi-port. Similarly, you can either do them all on midline, meaning um, having one, two, and three along the linea alba, um, some people will put them off midline um, to, again, just uh, make their workflow and make your hand adjustments easier. All right, we will play. Um, so this is a, the video I was trying to play, and this is courtesy of Dr. Singh. So um, you can see that he's already gotten his access, uh, did use a SILS port. So you can see that um, your, your telescope and your grasping devices are all going to be in that single plane or on plane. Uh, so very good example of the an anatomy right here. You can see uh, the telescope is in. He's already grasped the, the testicle uh, right there. So you can see it was just sitting back. Uh, often you'll find them kind of floating among the omentum. You can see he has drained the urinary bladder. It's very small. Um, and again, for a lot of these, you can trace them from your inguinal ring. So you can see that this is a caudal half of the patient. Um, and this is a testicle that is really in the caudal half of the body. Um, great anatomy here. So you can see the pampiniform plexus. You can see um, the attachment to the cremaster muscle going even further caudally into that inguinal ring. And then, um, again, just demonstrating how quick and straightforward some of these procedures can be. Just popping in the vessel sealing device. Sealing and transecting the vessels. I'm going through the two wheels there. And then all that's left is some connected tissue and then the muscle. This is a procedure that, again, um, typically I found the easiest or um, I guess most convenient way for me to do these is to have an assistant running the scope, meaning um, someone else driving the camera while I hold the testicle with the grasper in one hand and then I'm operating the vessel sealing device in the other. And that's it. Um, but again, the, the general, um, basics of the procedure, I'm going to do midline access again, typically for me, it's going to be a sills port placement, um, insufflate, and then identify where your protorca testicle is often, uh, again, somewhere from the kidney down to your inguinal canal. Once you've found it, it's, it's very straightforward and simple in terms of, um, similarities to an ovariectomy. Um, where you're just taking the vessel sealing device and going around the testicles. So you'll have to um, seal and ligate and transect your pampiniform plexus and the artery that are very closely associated. Um, and then lastly, going through the, the remnant of the tubules and their cream master muscle. Um, hopefully we'll get that video to play uh, after this. Um, one thing that can be of use or benefit for these patients to, is to use articulating instruments. So as you can see here, um, if you do have the opportunity or have the ability to use an articulating instrument, it can really help to move your graspers away from everything else. So your hands are clashing less. Um, it does come at an increased cost, but if you're going to be doing a lot of these procedures, it definitely would be a valuable investment to, to add articulating instruments. Um, and then again, if we can do the cryptorchidectomy, 
Um, without a vessel sealing device, you do have the opportunity to do these through a assisted procedure. What I mean by that is um, popping in your sills port or popping in some kind of port to uh, localize where the actual testicle is. Once you've identified it, you can do some of the dissection within the abdomen itself, but uh, most of us are going to be doing a laparoscopic assisted technique. You um, just center your port over where you think that you can actually pull the testicle out. You will see that uh, most of them will have a uh, large vascular pedicle that, again, is, is pretty easy and pretty mobile, so you can get it outside of the body to be able to do your extracorporeal ligation. This is actually an example of a um, torsion, a testicular torsion. So you can see that there is a highly engorged vascular pedicle here, and then the testicle itself is very abnormal just due to vascular stasis. So um, this is something that, uh, again, if you've identified this, you want to pop in the scope to be able to optimize your explore and then optimize your port placement. And then you can just um, use that to actually identify where you need to bring the testicle out and then do your actual ligations out of the body. Um, and again, if you do have a very large testicle or mass effect related to the testicle, you'll likely need a larger incision. And so, um, again, making this a, a laparoscopic assisted procedure um, may actually help with your efficiency. Um, one thing I will emphasize, and we already talked about it, but please be sure to submit these for histopath. Again, there's a very high rate of um, neoplasia within these, these cryptorchid testes. And so um, it can be of huge benefit to actually submit those for histopath. Um, conclusions, again, it's an excellent option to gain laparoscopic skills. Uh, it's a, generally a very straightforward procedure. So really allows you to maximize your, your skills and to get used to the triangulation, especially if you're not used to doing a reduced port or a single incision procedure. Um, and it does improve patient outcome while allowing for better visualization of the anatomy. Again, people definitely can do and still will be doing many laparotomy uh, procedures to identify this, but there are some very commonly reported devastating complications. So if you have this ability to do it, it definitely can improve your visualization of this scenario. Yeah, I, I will say too, I, you know, <clears throat> the, you mentioned it, emptying the urinary bladder is super important. And, um, you know, if, if that doesn't happen or if it's incomplete, you can always just stick a urinary catheter down intra. Oh, good question. So um, from Paulina asked if, if it's possible to take metastatic lymph nodes at the same time. Um, so assuming that um, we're dealing with a, a metastatic um, tumor, um, I definitely think that it would be a, a considerable option if the case selection is appropriate, meaning if that it is a case where your sublumbar lymph nodes are um, enlarged or identified to have metastasis. Um, and particularly if they're small and accessible. I would say the, the downside to some of these tumors, well, the good thing is they carry a very good prognosis, meaning that if you can catch these before there's any perineoplastic syndrome or any evidence of metastasis, it often is curative for those patients. Um, if there is metastasis, the concerning side of things is that um, they can metastasize very quickly. And so um, I would say at least in my my experience or my personal situation, I've only seen these cases where they're either confined to the testicle alone or it's highly metastatic where most of those patients are not going to um, be able to undergo a laparoscopic surgery. So often I will be opening if there, there are very large um, metastatic burdens. Um, but I would say if, if there was a, a case that showed up that had a smaller lymph node that was accessible and um, I thought laparoscopy would be useful, then I would go ahead with a, a laparoscopic dissection. 